My name is Randy Horton. I'm Vice President of Solutions and Partnerships here at Orthogonal. Uh, very briefly, for those of you who don't know us, Orthogonal's mission is to improve patient outcomes faster. And the way we do it is by applying modern product development and software engineering techniques to accelerate the development and ongoing improvement of connected medical device systems, software as a medical device, and digital therapeutics. Thanks to all of you for turning out today. Uh, it's a great attendance that's growing, had a really strong uh, response to this that we're seeing in the webinar panel. So thrilled to have all of you. Briefly, it's been 10 years um, since TIR 45, which was the first guidance on using agile practices in medical software development came out. And a lot's happened in the last decade. We've really come a very long way. And I think we're going to be coming a long way in the next decade. So to kind of mark this anniversary and do a look back at what have we learned in the last 10 years and where do we think the next 10 years is going to be going in medical device software, we're doing a series of events over the second half of this year. This is the second of those events that we're doing. And it's actually a continuation of the first event because we literally had so many questions came in at the first event that we couldn't even handle half of them. And so what we decided to do was peel them off. So let me reintroduce our panelists from before. We're not going to go in depth on their background because frankly, if you've already registered and shown up, um, I think you probably think it's worth hearing anyway. And if you want to know their detailed credentials, you can go check it out on our website and in the prior webinar, which I recommend is a good forerunner to this, although they are standalone and you can see them separately. Um, so we've got Michael Iglesias and Larkin Lowry. Uh, also joining us recently back from an international vacation is Bernhard Kappa, Orthogonal's founder and CEO. Um, and between them, they have a tremendous breadth and depth of experience across, geez, between them, probably a couple of dozen medical device companies doing various forms of connected devices, software as a medical device, and digital therapeutics, as well as uh, experience from other industries and other types of software besides medical devices that are highly related, such as automotive telematics and telecommunications. Um, and one of, you know, Michael worked on the very first iPhone, which all those you could pretty much think of as critical infrastructure. These are things that you don't want to go down any more than you want a medical device to go down. And so they'll be talking about how do we move faster and break nothing? How do we accelerate medical device software development using modern techniques without finding basic bugs to be unacceptable? And so that we know at the end of the day that the code we're putting in these devices is code we'd be comfortable operating with operating directly on a member of our own family. Um, so background, we had a first webinar about a month ago, a little more, um, around agile medical devices, the 10 year look back, the 10 year look forward. And the questions kind of came in two buckets. One was sort of a strategic set of questions. How do you do this? How do you bring together modern engineering methods, fast feedback loops with the safety and compliance and regulatory structures we have in place in med tech for very good reasons, because you don't want to move fast and break things with a medical device, because what you'd be breaking, of course, would be a human being. Um, but we also had a ton of questions that came in then that were much more detailed of, okay, I got the concept, but how do you actually do it? What happens when you throw into the pot 62304, 1345, 14971, sorry if I'm throwing any of these numbers off, Agile, you know, quality, and you you mix it up and you try and actually have a functioning uh, medical device development organization. How do you make these things work? So what we did was we deferred all the more detailed questions to this webinar, and we're going to be going in, into them today. If you have questions, please put them in the Zoom chat. We'll do our best to, um, to, to, to get to them. And if we don't get to them, we may just be starting a tradition that you have to ask questions in one webinar, but they won't get asked to the next one. But I think we're, we're cautiously optimistic that we'll, uh, we'll be able to get to a lot of your questions. So what we've done is we sort of group them together into some buckets. Um, so what I'm going to do is I'm going to throw out some, actually, I'll, I'll read a couple of questions at a time and then step back and Michael and Bernhard and Larkin will kind of explore a group of questions at a topic. So if that sounds good to everybody, let us know. Um, we'd love to hear your Q&A as we go. I haven't seen any yet, but we'll be looking for them. Okay. Thank you all. So first question, set of questions we got was about how do you break down work in units of work in medical device software into workable chunks? Because there seems to be this, this balance we're doing between large monolithic systems that have lots and lots of things going on and get so big that they're not really manageable, as opposed to systems that are so uniquely and discreetly defined that it's really flexible in terms of a software architecture, but you end up almost creating 375 different devices just to create your one device? And how, how do you strike a balance and how do you draw those boundary lines 
between software architecture, features, definitions of what's in a device or not a device, and how does that translate to things like team size and team organization? Um, you know, they say nine women can't make a baby in a month. The question is, can three women make a baby in three months? What's 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 the balance here? So with that, let you all take it. Well, that's a great lead in uh, 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 for this. Um, I think ultimately, right, the when we're doing systems that have more and more software in them, right? That's what's happening everywhere, but certainly medical devices have gotten more complex, more connected, and uh, there are more modular things, right? Especially if you're on top of mobile, cloud, connected in uh, to devices. And it, in those cases, just sort of basic good modern software practices of modularity uh, and, you know, definition of interfaces make, you know, make a ton of sense as, as a baseline, right? One big monolithic thing is not going to be easy to maintain and it's not going to be e easy to modify. So that's just good software development practices, right? Um, but I think there are, uh, uh, so breaking things into smaller chunks makes sense. In some cases, if you're going to be reusing components or reusing platform types of things, then thinking about those as individually sort of verifiable and verified and documented components, uh, you know, are, are sort of things to think about that, to make all of that, uh, uh, all of that easier. Um, and, uh, and, you know, that's, that's kind of at, at the, the, the base, right? I think, Michael, you've got some, you know, uh, some thoughts on kind of the boundaries of device de definitions and what does and does not need to be, you know, in the device uh, and how you can get into trouble in those things, right? Yeah, so like kind of what you were saying, uh, Bernhard, uh, we, we, you know, in one company, uh, we, we spun up a very, very small team and we said, hey, we, you know, for the entire product portfolio that the company wants to build of these mobile apps and clouds and uh, connected devices, we went back and said, well, they're all going to share like common uh, components and features and things like that. So then we sp spun up kind of like a fr what we called a software frameworks team, and they were responsible for building these kind of a white label, um, very low uh, documented uh, at a validation level or in verified uh, to be reused and uh, across many different devices. So if you kind of think about it from a physical device, uh, if I have like an insulin pen and it has all these little plastic parts and a spring and all kinds of things, every, all these parts are in like a bin on a shelf. And you say, I want to build a, I have a shop, a grocery shopping list. And I say, I want to build this device and I need all of these parts. And I just go over to the shelf and pull all the parts out and then assemble it. And now you have a medical device. Well, we took that same kind of thought um, and put that into software. So we had iOS software for uh, iOS frameworks. And then we had Android frameworks and they were really mirrored. And then the product teams, when they're going to build their medical device, they can say, okay, I need you know, X, Y, and Z frameworks, pull those off and then integrate them into the product. And they were all already, like you said, pre-verified. So they're not soup of uh, you know, software of unknown pedigree. They're now software of known pedigree. And they even had a, even, uh, you know, a really small uh, you know, verification or validation package that we just uh, referenced in the, fi the finished medical device. Um, so that's that's one way um, that I have seen been pretty successful um, with respect to you know trying to build a larger product, um, but you have a smaller team uh, help building these kind of uh, reusable components. Larkin, I know that you you've dealt with yeah. that also in terms of team size and uh, mm -hmm. and sort of team composition for very large projects. Yeah, and that, that's really uh, very important here in terms of how to chunk things into manageable slices. So just to kind of go back and, and be theoretical on Agile for just a second, you know, the idea behind it is to produce um, short and discrete iterations that allow you to learn from very small increments rather than trying to create a moonshot and finding out, you know, two years later that you missed the mark. So, you know, as part of each iteration, you need to complete the entire product development cycle. You have to do everything. You have to completely validate that what you're delivering in that short cycle uh, is worthy of being released to production, even if you don't actually uh, end up shipping it. So when you think about 
that goal of Agile and then combined with Scrum's goal of releasing uh, usable software at each sprint, you now have to start thinking about what can you achieve in a single sprint? And uh, what uh, a lot of folks in, in um, you know, the outer soccer world have found is that you know, Scrum teams are most effective when they're small. Uh, there's the old saying of uh, it should be a two pizza team, right? How many engineers can you feed with two pizzas? And it ends up being, you know, depending on the team, you know, about maybe eight people, right, is what a scrum team should be. And that's not just, you know, eight software engineers. You probably are going to have maybe a, a UI UX person. You're going to have a couple of folks from quality, maybe a quality engineer and an automation engineer or some combination. You know, and you know, some number of software engineers actually doing the development. So you have to think about this team operating autonomously. How effective can they be at delivering some unit of functionality? Uh, if you uh, give them too much, too large of scope, uh, they're not going to be effective at delivering that. Uh, you're going to need more bodies to be thrown into it. And so that's your first indication that you need to de-scope. Right. Let's trim down this particular unit of functionality into something that this one Scrum team can execute and deliver, and that basically means, you know, pairing things way back, but also being able to pair back uh, what you're going to be validating. Right. So this makes your validation exercise much more discreet and focused, and in my opinion, and, and what I've observed, a lot more achievable. So we had a. Yeah, Oh, go so ahead. A relevant question that came in um, to build on this. It says, someone's saying, so are you saying that to break down a monolithic system, you should use risk classification and device class is the way to encapsulate or contain modules or define them? I think that's one of the tools. I think, uh, you know, some of this is, is, is really, you know, just good architecture and, and good practices, right? You, you want to, you know, orthogonalize your modules you want to uh you know make sure you don't have cascading failures within system just robust systems but then actually using uh software safety classification per iec uh, 62304 um and uh and then segregation techniques uh as part of that obviously you know, I would be judicious about segregation techniques. Uh, they can add additional burdens. So if your software is all class, you know, it's a class one device and with all with class A functionality, then don't do all the extra segregation. But if you have say for sure, class C functionality in there, you have to do that. But uh, yes, that is one way of doing that. And then obviously the the risk will also tell you at what level of granularity you need uh, to do uh, your documentation, your risk management uh, um, uh, activities, risk mitigations, uh, et cetera, uh, and other special controls around that. Yeah, and in terms of just uh, software architecture practices, uh, you know, employing uh, domain-driven development as a practice uh, helps you better uh, identify what those boundaries are and how to best partition your code from a functional standpoint. So that's another good place to go. I think one of the questions was around uh, a, a device definition, or right, the boundaries of, uh, of your device. Um, it's not, you know, there's no hard and fast rule around that, but in general, I would say, you know, some of the lessons we've learned is within your commercial product, let's say, uh, there may be features, especially, again, you've got a mobile app, you have a cloud, you've got web, and not necessarily purely things that are sitting inside of a, a device, but it applies there as well things that are not strictly part of the medical device functionality, right? You may have some reminders, alerts, reporting, other types of things that are useful and beneficial to the user uh, of the system. Uh, you might have gam gamification, you might have who knows what kind of features, right? Uh, reordering of, uh, of supplies or, or what have you. All of those things are, you are not part of the medical device. They may be part of the system. And if you put those into your design history file as part of a 510K, 
you are going to get all kinds of questions on things and all kinds of why and how, et cetera. You know, you may have them in your commercial product, but draw a line around it. Those are not, uh, uh, those are not part of your medical device and your regulators will thank you. <laughs> uh, uh, everyone will thank you. And when you have to update your software at a later point, uh, you'll be glad you did that. You know, but, the only thing I can say yeah. is that you have to, you know, make sure that issues in those areas do not cause cascading failures in other parts of the system. But this doesn't mean that you actually don't do the documentation, that you don't follow the, the, the processes, right? I mean, the way that I look at uh, the regulations is that, uh, you know, the government entities want to make sure that you're following some minimum standard uh, of software development for quality purposes. You as a business should be setting the bar a lot higher and should be doing these things uh, anyway, in order to maintain the quality of the product for the well-being of your customers and of your business, right? So um, the, the distinction that I would make uh, from what Bernhard was saying is that, you know, there's maybe you're going to keep two sets of books, maybe, right? For the uh, parts of the system that are not regulated, you keep a separate set of books that you use internally to maintain your own quality standards. Then for the medical device portion, you maintain a set of books that you then would be submitting to the regulators but you still do the same things. Right, so, right. Um, I think those are good segues to the next question. By the way, we're getting good questions from, uh, from our attendees, some of which really logically fit into sections we'll be covering in the future. So if we don't hit your question right now, we're because we're, we're, we're slotting in it later. So that does lead into the second question, which is what happens when well-documented medical device development meets Agile? Our worlds colliding. Is this is this a is this an inherently uh, conflict ridden relationship, or is this a symbiotic relationship? And some of the more detailed questions we got about are how do you do um, avoid duplicative work, for instance, when creating a design history file? How do you align regulatory documentation and processes with agile processes? Where inherently, you know, one of the founding principles of agile was. <laughs> the best kind of documentation is working code, right? <laughs> Don't spend a lot of time writing requirements, just build your code. Um, changing a Can mindset I... around evidence, you know, is another question, so. Um, I'll, I'll start uh, uh, on this. I think um, you, look, there are particular constraints within, uh, uh, within medical device development where you're going to have to do documentation. You're, there, you're going to have to verify and validate, and you're going to have to do risk management that are not part of standard agile practices, right? Um, the benefits of smaller chunks, faster feedback, uh, self-organizing teams, uh, you know, testing automation, all of those are there in Agile, even if you add those things on, right? Um, I think one of the things you wanna be really careful of when you do this is um, not have your development methodology baked into your quality management system, right? Because uh, you may wanna change it uh, along the way. You just wanna make sure that those things that what's in your SOPs is generally applicable, even if you change your methodology. Uh, otherwise, you can't adjust, you can't improve, etc. And then you have uh, uh, all of the methodology more at a product level in plans uh, and uh, uh, and perhaps in work work instructions. Uh, but you're really you're creating the same documentation, you're just doing it iteratively. And if you have the right tooling uh, along the way, you can do it not as a separate activity of creating documentation for documentation's sake, but uh, in a way that is part of your development process, right? Um, I think that's the key. It's not an extra activity, it is something that is an output of your regular development methodology in, in an agile process. Michael, Larkin? Yeah, so, um, you know, to just add to what Bernhard is, is saying, right, it's, um, you know, the, the documentation needs to be uh, of use, right? This isn't uh, just a homework exercise that, 
uh, you do for the regulator, you put it on the shelf and let it gather dust. Uh, the documentation is, you know, the reasons why the, the regulator wants the documentation is because it provides some sort of value. And uh, they may believe it has a, a value and you may not believe the same thing. But still, the point of it is that uh, there is a purpose behind it. Now, you know, I look at documentation um, as really just being a means of conveying information so that it can be easily consumed by reviewers. That reviewer might be uh, a regulator, or might be somebody doing an audit. The reviewer may be your product owner. Uh, the reviewer may be your software engineer that, that has to implement uh, a requirement. Uh, so the objective of the documentation is to be consumable by the particular audience that you have. Now, uh, documentation that is optimal for consumption by a software engineer is probably not very optimal for consumption by other human beings, right? Because software engineers just, you know, think differently and they consume information differently. Uh, I really do like the idea of being able to treat documentation as code. Uh, you know, we've done a webinar on using Birkin syntax to encode requirements into a machine readable file format that you can then produce documentation from. Uh, in the future, it's looking like I might do a, a webinar on how to use the open API um, specification format for encoding your API designs and then producing documentation from that and then also enabling uh, automation. So the idea here is if you use a machine readable uh, format for encoding the information, you're able to then produce documentation in a form that a regulator, an auditor uh, can consume. You're also going to be able to produce content that a software engineer is going to be able to consume or a quality engineer is going to be able to consume. Um, and if we think about documentation, you know, if you're starting with a Word doc, I think you're doing it wrong, right? I think we have to start thinking about how can we start with something that is machine readable and use that to generate our documentation. In other, in other words, to be able to convey the information in that, in that machine readable file into a form that can be consumed by the different audiences. And then at that point, you've woven in the documentation and the function of the documentation into your agile process. Um, and it just, it, it integrates very, very well. Yeah, so like to, I, I like that because you're you're essentially you know killing two birds with one stone, right? And then that kind of that ends that whole uh, question of why why are we doing so much redundant documentation? And even now, uh, with with where I am, we I get that question uh, on a daily basis. How can we reduce do having to do all this level of documentation? It feels redundant, and I agree with them. And I said, yeah, okay, it it is kind of redundant. Let's let's see if we can really right size how to do uh, to do this documentation so it's not so burdensome. Okay. We've got um, a couple of good comments that have come in for color on this. One is from somebody who's been engaged with Amy TIR45, I believe, both originally and now with the, the updated versions coming out, who says, basically, when all else fails, read the instructions. So <laughs> if you're interested in this conversation <laughs> and you haven't read TIR45, please do so. It'll save you a lot of pain. Um, also, I'll, I'll, I'll divert everybody with a joke for a second. So there's the old joke that uh, if it doesn't work, read the instructions. And if it still doesn't work, follow the instructions. There's an important distinction. Right, Excellent. right. Excellent. Yeah. I think those are actually, that's in TIR 45. <laughs> <laughs> uh, the other one is, um, you know, I don't know if I should be using last names or not. So I'll just do first names here for privacy, but uh, throw it to Scott who says, hey, when agile and regulation intersect, if you put in you can put in structures in your coding processes and architectures, for instance, prompting engineers to add specific kind of comments when they're checking in code, which would be the things that regulators would be looking for. So not just have a general comment bucket, but essentially nudge people to put in certain kinds of things that are written or structured in a way that are more useful to people upstream or downstream, I guess, depending on how you're looking at the stream. You know, he says regulators yeah, so that, will actually look at some of these, you know, an FDA. Yeah, might so that's why... Yeah building checklists into into your processes uh, and into your tooling uh, it is super helpful. Right? Will Especially engineers for actually really metrics. comply with that? Or do well, they, will they fight back no matter what against, you know? Um, you know, there is the, uh, the complaint from engineers that comments within code become obsolete very quickly because engineers, when they do maintenance on code, they do maintenance on code, they don't do maintenance on comments. 
Um, and so, uh, you know, it's very hard for a machine to verify that you have updated your comment correctly. It's a lot easier to verify that you've updated the code correctly. So uh, generally speaking, there is a distrust of comments within code uh, for this reason, they become obsolete and, and, and out, of, you know, out of date with wrong information. Uh, there is another approach which is uh, very related. So rather than uh, you know, relying on comments, there is, uh, for most languages anyway, the ability to create uh, structured annotations uh, that you can mark up your code with. Uh, I've used this extensively at previous companies to actually generate documentation. Whereas the, the developer is producing their code, they can annotate the different functions and classes uh, with these structured annotations, which give us the ability to then generate structured documentation from those annotations. And it's a little bit easier for the machine to verify that they have uh, produced those annotations correctly. And you can handle that also, you know, obviously when you do pull requests and, and such where if you do have a, you know, design review by, other developers or uh, or potentially even you know systems engineers as uh, as needed so okay so before we hop to our next set of questions which relates to human factors and integrating the function of human factors in i want to say we've got a lot of really good questions coming in some of which we'll be able to incorporate um what i promise everybody here is we're going to get through our four core topics in 45 minutes but if you want to hang out longer we'll be hanging out longer and can answer a lot of these questions as they come up, if you don't have time to stay, you can um, you know, check out the video when it's when it's available shortly uh, for that. So we we we'll, we'll get you out in forty five minutes, unless you want to stay for ninety, in which case we'll be here for ninety. You know, building questions. Um, okay, so the next set of questions came around: What happens when you add human factors to this agile agile medical device software mix? And a couple of the specific questions we got are: How do you balance project specific requirements of human factors within an agile process? Um, another person said it's easy to imagine and imagine an agile formative human factors test, but how would you define an agile human factors summative test? Um, and then somebody else asked, if you want to do more frequent releases, how does uh, you know risk management with fourteen nine seventy one and human factor standards with six two three six six integrate into agile and allow for more frequent launches? So now I'm going to hide while you all try and answer those questions. I can start with uh, with the first one, um, you know. So obviously, in all of this, there is, you know, you don't start with an agile cadence from day one, right? There's upfront work that maybe takes longer in human factors, doing task analysis, understanding use errors, and how those might fit in with your preliminary hazard analysis. But then, relatively quickly, we have found that you you know, the same agile practices of small chunks, fast, frequent feedback to reduce risk, to increase, you know, confidence in what you're doing makes sense for user experience design and for human factors. So for that, the way we like to think about it is these are integrated teams where you have user experience design and human factors working together on a, on a sprint cadence uh, with some feedback, obviously, from, from developers and from others as part of that. And, you know, on the, on the human factor size, leveraging the, the sort of concept of three user Thursdays, backlog of, uh, of human factors uh, and design considerations that you are testing every two weeks or so the way the way we do it with users and you're basically working off your formative uh, uh, human factors backlog and you know sometimes that gets very granular and sometimes you go back and let's go up and test something end to end right um, and so I think that kind of cadence is what you really need and you want to stay ahead of development to the point where you have you know designs you know, confidence in the design so that that can go into the, you know, story refinement, story baking, and then development uh, uh, process and doing metrics around this process as well. Velocity of design, velocity of uh, reducing uh, uh, risk and, uh, and defect rate. When does something come back out to design? Um, 
that's really, you know, the core stuff until you get out into the market and start adding quantitative data, you know, from product analytics and uh, other ways of collecting data back into the process to continue to improve the product. Arkin, Michael? Yeah, so I'll go with this. Uh, so from, you know, when you want to balance project specific requirements of HF uh, with an agile process, what I've done and seen is, you know, we've had the teams, we leverage these uh, stakeholder demos, you know, at the end of every sprint or iteration as an informal kind of a human factors or a validation activity. And then what we've, what we've also done is considered uh, doing these engineering builds. Uh, we release those to the internal project team members to use, like as if they are a real user. Um, and obviously report bugs or errors or anything like that to feed back into the, the next sprint or backlog. Um, and then also these same kind of engineering builds, when you get to a, a build freeze, uh, you can also take those same builds and go to a real formative um, HF study. And depending on the product and your company, you can, uh, you can have X amount of you know, real formative HF studies, but you can also pre-polish, so to speak, the, the product before you put it in front of real, uh, real users. And if you do that throughout your product life cycle, you do these design freezes at maybe big milestones of the product, uh, and you're doing those real HF studies with real users, that's your formative HF. Uh, you've done it in an agile fashion, but we all know that a, a human factor study only lasts maybe about a week, right? And you can't really spin up a bunch of agile uh, releases and fixes within that one week. So by kind of doing it at a very a longer iterative uh, cycle and in a formative thing internally and maybe externally, when you get to that final uh, human fact of su a summative uh, study, it should go really, really smooth and there should not be any major findings uh, or anything like that. And of course, you know, you're always probably gonna run into some, some level of software errors or bugs, uh, but you would just uh, triage those and manage those uh, through their own process. So I think I've maybe answered uh, the first and second question, I hope. Yeah, and to reinforce what uh, Michael was just describing, you know, the, the agile process and Scrum in particular, you know, it encourages you to rele release um, valuable software frequently. Uh, Scrum in particular, every sprint, they want you to do a, a, be able to release to production. That doesn't mean that at the beginning of the sprint, the developers have never seen the thing before, never heard of it before, haven't thought about any of it before, right? You give the developers a story that is baked. Uh, you've gone through a process to prepare that story for execution, and that preparation is going to involve doing your formatives and doing studies, potentially even doing some prototyping, et cetera, as Michael was describing. So, you know, even though agile is really, it's pushing you to do, uh, to produce releasable code at every uh, sprint or every iteration, uh, it doesn't mean that from uh, back of the napkin to delivery to the customer has to happen within that short period of time. So thinking about a pipeline, uh, where you are staging your development, uh, where your stories are, going through an iterative st uh, set of stages where they become more and more refined until they're finally ready for the developers to implement. Um, you know, it doesn't mean, you know, you're not uh, uh, really reducing the overall development time from beginning to end, but you're also enabling parallelization, right? When you have completed one uh, formative study, you can move on to the next one without waiting for the developers to do anything. So you can run your teams in parallel uh, by keeping this pipeline um, filled. And I think for the the kind of you know for the the formal summative human factors, right? A, a, a good analogy is all of the kind of testing work you do during development, right? Uh, if you're doing test driven uh, development, behavior driven design, and you are you know building out unit tests and functional uh, tests and maybe automating those tests as well as integration tests, you're doing that as part of your process and building out that scaffolding and testing and testing throughout the process. Um, and then at some point, you're going to have a design freeze and you're going to do formal verification, right? There's no, and we keep going, right? You may keep going, but there's a design freeze. And, and when you do that formal verification, you don't end up with surprises because you've been iterating through and doing all of that, you know, both on an integration full system as it exists level and on the individual things. Summative human factors is the same. All the, the work that makes that go 
smoothly and no surprises is all the formative work and the frequency of the formative work that you've done. Very often, traditionally, human factors work has been we do. We don't do it often enough, and you end up with surprises at the end. And that's really the, the whole idea of agile processes is, you know, you get surprises, but you get them early and often, and you can adjust to them. That's the same thing on 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 human factors. The one thing I will say is that, you know, the need to do summative human factors really should be risk based, right? Is there uh, uh, is there patient risk uh, that is sufficient in uh, out uh, as a result of use errors uh, that you need to uh, that need to deal with? That is the the core stuff that needs to be in your. Uh, in your summative human factors. In many cases, for very low risk things, just doing a lot of formative is enough and you don't necessarily have to do full summative testing, right? So it's kind of like, you know, as the FDA always says, use a risk-based approach on that. And that's that's what I would say about, you know, things like summative uh, human factors. So I want to make sure we get to our fourth topic, and I apologize, everybody, again, we get tons of good questions coming in, trying to integrate them, and we can cover them in the, in the latter 45 minutes, um, and, or if not, in another webinar. But over to software configuration management and change control. Um, I think there's a, there's a set of questions around how do you use change control and design change procedures to main stuff, maintain software using agile methodologies, presumably in a way that's also you know, can, uh, conforms to how we approach things in medical devices. How do you divide, de, uh, define regulated, validated quality management systems with DevOps? Um, how do you handle design input reviews in an agile setting? Um, and let me see, we had a couple other good questions that came here. A couple questions about what happens with change control when you mix um, essentially one product that has both a medical device in it, as well as non-device functions in there doing change controls. Um, and, and how do you manage that and submit that? So I will throw those out. Folks, we've got like five, six minutes, and then we're going to basically wrap on this and we'll keep going. But folks can uh, drop off knowing they've gotten the core questions. So. That's a lot of stuff. <laughs> <laughs> no pressure. So... So uh, I'll go first, I guess, you know, uh, 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 I think in general, right, with, with agile practices, uh, you are iterating quickly, you're going through things quickly, and you're, as you build a more and more complex system, if you don't have tooling and automation for that stuff, you know, you're going to get slower and slower. So it really relies heavily on having, you know, things like, uh, uh, you know, configuration management that is, you know, uh, uh, CICD um, pipelines, test-driven developments, uh, uh, having testing and things like that built up around uh, that. So, you need to extend that same thing to the design controls and to the documentation and and really you know not everyone does this but but we have found tremendous value in putting in place kind of EQMS plus ALM PLM uh, ideally integrated that actually works at the level of granularity of the software development process right and that allows you to then automate so much of the documentation, integrate in with CI/CD, and generate, uh, make making sure that uh, that your, you know, your your process is working and is efficient, and you don't have defects within it. Yeah, I mean, if you have uh, comprehensive automation on your testing, uh, top to bottom. Uh, you can typically run your full battery of regression tests and uh, requirements of verification tests, et cetera, in a very short period of time. So if you uh, are going to be exploring a change to look for consequences of a change, your automation is going to be able to tell you the answer in a blink, uh, relatively speaking, right? So the, uh, the, the automation that you add in gives you 
two things. One is it gives you greater confidence that, uh, you know, what the impact of your particular change is, uh, but it gives you the ability to um, improve the cycle time uh, radically, right? Because it becomes a, a press of a button instead of being, uh, you know, a long drawn out process with a bunch of manual testers clicking buttons. Uh, you know, and this leads me to uh, one of the other questions that Randy brought up, which is, uh, you know, how does this apply to DevOps and in, in, in particular into uh, to infrastructure? Um, you know, if you take an infrastructure as code approach uh, using something like Terraform, uh, which is produced by HashiCorp, uh, that allows you to build out and manage your infrastructure using code, code that is maintained in your Git repo. It's under, it's subject to the same change control processes that you have for source code, all the reviews, uh, et cetera. Uh, but, you know, an important aspect of this and how it ties to the, the previous question is that, you um, in order for your testing to truly be repeatable, you need to be able to build out a brand new um, system in a, in a known state so that you can run your test repeatably in that particular known state. Uh, infrastructure as code allows you to guarantee that the environment that you're running your tests in are at a known state, right? And this allows us at the same time to be able to produce a validated infrastructure uh, for our system to operate. And it gives us the tools to verify through automation that the infrastructure is in the configuration that we expected it to be in. Um, so again, it gives us repeatable tests. It also gives us the ability to validate um, that our infrastructure is in the correct configuration. So that's, uh, you know, again, using Terraform, you can't do quite everything with Terraform, but, you know, co combinations of Terraforms and some scripting, maybe Ansible playbooks uh, is, is really a great way to achieve, achieve quite a lot uh, on this front. And I think that's where also just the automation of the documentation uh, with with ALM PLM tools also helps, right? And if you can integrate those things, you can you can see where quickly without having to do all this manual work, you know, where are the impacts of change? What what are we doing? And if you extend that as well, thinking of DevOps as sort of like, really, this is your entire value change. So not just your development and your infrastructure, but your other processes that are needed to make the sausage, make the medical device, your risk management process, your human factors process, your requirements definition process, et cetera. Those are kind of part of that, that value chain as well. Um, and again, that's where the ALM PLM really helps you uh, uh, by integrating those different things. Okay, so we're almost done with our core period. So a couple of wrapping comments for those who need to drop off now. Uh, first of all, thank you for joining us. This material will be coming online with the video, a summary, and get to the last webinar. If you're on this list to join here, don't worry, we'll be telling you about upcoming ones. The next event is actually on August 20th, we'll be talking about uh, the evolution of SAMD regulation in the United States. And uh, frankly, that fits a lot into here. How do you how do you how do you run your software projects for software as a medical device in this sort of evolving regulatory state? Um, also, one other person following up on Patty's comment, Kelly said, hey, if you really like and read the manual version one that came out 10 years ago, TIR 45, just make sure everybody knows that sometime later this year, I believe, version two is coming out. And uh, they specifically mentioned that version two briefly addresses human factors and some are informative with Agile. So uh, with that, we can keep going with some questions here. Uh, yeah, I'd say one comment on that in the, you know, in a, one of the critiques of TIR 45, uh, the original one was that, you know, how you handle risk management wasn't really addressed in there, right? And I think uh, from talking to a number of folks on the committee, uh, uh, you know, a lot of it was, well, we didn't really, you know, come to a consensus uh, around that. So um, that's risk management is probably still the hardest thing to integrate in uh, in well. I can say we've, We've made good attempts and good things that I think are, have improved and made risk management or more agile, but I think that is still in many ways a work in progress for, for a lot of companies. We're, we're better than we were a year ago, two years ago, 
Uh, but we, st I think as an industry and certainly in our company, we still have ways to go to be, feel like, oh yeah, we got that nailed. So. Um, couple questions came in about basically if you're running sprint teams, how do you fuse these worlds? So let me read the three questions to you and you can break them out how you want. Can you give us time consumed in sprint zero to prepare the sprint N. Do you record sprint zero in the documentation to show the quality of your development? And do you approve your sprint backlog as module requirements, design put? And at what time is it part of sprint planning? This is really getting down to the brass tacks. Yeah. So, um, you know, sprint zero is kind of a symbolic uh, labeling. Uh, it may actually be more than one sprint. Uh, so you're basically uh, building out uh, and, and baking that story that you're eventually going to give a developer. And the amount of time required is just, uh, for you know, in my experience uh, does vary a little bit. But in terms of how you treat that sprint or a set of sprints, it's no different than any other sprint. You want to be recording all of your performance metrics because uh, you know, the process of baking your stories to make them ready for developers is part of your overall timeline. It is a variable that you need to optimize for, and it's important, right? So all of the other uh, progress and performance monitoring processes that uh, I go through for any sprint applies to these, uh, these preparation sprints. And we tend to look at it as sort of um, kind of there's a, a technical elaboration phase, right? Things you need to have in place in order to be able to actually do agile development, right? So in, in the case of a medical device, well, you know, you need to be under design controls at some point unless the activity you're doing is specifically a technical spike or something that's outside of design controls. So you've got to have at least draft software development plans, not finalized software development plans, verification, uh, uh, planning activities, configuration management, et cetera. Those are kind of things that need to be in place if you're doing your development under design controls. It's, it's uh, I uh, looking at that as sprint zero uh, to my mind is, it that isn't necessarily, some of those are not, agile activities, right? Um, they're agile in the sense that all of these are in draft state until you sort of close the uh, uh, phase gates and you have the ability to update uh, uh, that, uh, that type of documentation uh, uh, along the way. Um, so, you know, the, the goal is really get ready to do development under design controls. Um, figure out what those things are, get to that point, then you're ready for, you know, for sprint one, basically. Yeah, I would say um, what what I've seen and, and currently do is we consider, you know, the total product life cycle, you start with concept, you have development, which is the largest portion of that, and then you have maintenance. And what, what we've kind of done is map sprint zero, we consider is the bridge to development. It sits between concept and right into development. And if you really think about it, you could, you could map concept as design planning. You can do uh, sprint zero as design inputs. And then your sprint in N plus one is, uh, you know, design outputs and et cetera, et cetera. So you, so as part of sprint zero, all your design inputs, this is where you would be defining all of your requirements, product requirements, uh, system requirements, uh, software requirements, acceptance criteria, tests, if you're doing test driven development, um, and then you can consider that as your, if you're going to do a DIR, design input review, that could be your uh, design input review, all of Sprint Zero. But again, that's just one company that does it like that, that I have seen. Um, many other companies do it slightly different. So, And others, yeah, and, I think, sort of modularize that so you, yeah. can, you can do this for that flow for smaller components so you're not doing a you know, yep. big design up front. Right. right, and then at the and then like that that life cycle that I was uh, kind of explaining at the very end, sp uh, sprint Z or iteration Z, that's essentially your bridge to deployment. That's all of your deployment. Are we ready to go to market? We've completed V and V. So that's how uh, one of the you know one of the companies uh, that I've been at looks at it. 
you know, and it's important for me to, to think about every participant in this entire process as an agile participant, all following the same methodology, the same mindset, the same goals, same agile goals. Uh, you can't have uh, some unit in your process uh, doing whatever process they want. And uh, you're trying to shoehorn them into your agile process. Everybody has to be following agile, thinking agile, and uh, working together in a coordinated manner, right? And, and that, uh, you know, sometimes it's hard for parts of the organization that are not yet used to it. They think of agile as being, oh, that's for the, the software engineers. Uh, we don't have to do it that way. And look, it's true, you don't have to do it that way, but wouldn't you rather do it that way? You'll be more productive, you'll produce better work product, and you'll, you'll do that with less stress at, at the same time. Yeah, that's the whole concept of, of right. DevOps is really analyzing value chain, using using modularity, using fast feedback loops, and extending it beyond development. If all you're doing is agile, it just in your development process, you're you're you know you're you're only getting a quarter of the benefit. Right, uh, because if all the other processes around it can't take fast feedback, don't give fast feedback, uh, then then you know you're you're rate limited and constrained by that, and and uh, and it only you know you get big problems at, at in uh, that are harder to solve uh, at more discrete, you know, longer intervals as opposed to a bunch of small problems that are easy to solve and easy to adjust for uh, uh, that that agile and lean processes let you do. Yeah, actually there's, for what it's worth, there's a fascinating episode you can find on the public radio show, This American Life, probably at least a decade old, where they tell the story of how Toyota opened up the books on everything in total quality management to GM in the 1980s at a place called Numi Motors, which was the lowest performing GM factory in the world. And they sent a bunch of people there to learn the method and they came back and it became the highest performing factory. And they're like, everybody's like, why, why would Toyota open the books to GM on all of this? It turns out because Toyota knew that there was no way that GM could actually do what the real special sauce was, which was implementing that across their entire supply chain, not just in one factory. And that's ultimately it fell apart. Um, I, I have to say, you know, W.C. Fields, the comedian, used to, when he'd tell a joke that he had bought from one of the, the joke sellers in the group, when he'd tell the joke and people would laugh, he goes, that one's from one of the kids in the hall. I feel like we should be paying people for the quality of some of these questions here. Um, another one related on sprints that came up from Milos. How do you mark milestones like phase reviews? So in general, right, I think the... Um, you know, you do the review process, you know, on on a granular level and perhaps at a larger level throughout the process. I think the important thing is that um, you're, you may have ch changes in design inputs. You may have new design inputs. You may, you know, have, have changes along the way. The idea is you're handling those changes. So the way to think about the phase gates is not as you know, close this, we, we do a review, we're done, we've closed this phase, it's locked, we can't go back into it, right? It's not end to beginning parallelism, it's end to end parallelism. So your design inputs, a, 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 all of these things may stay open until, you know, for, for us at least, typically it's we're we're going to do a design freeze and uh, and a code freeze and we're going into formal verification. At that point, you know, pencils down. All of these things have to be locked. And so you want to sort of like, okay, design puts you close before you close. Uh, um, you know, later phases and and so it's kind of like a open the gates, close the gates, uh, kind of thing. That allows you to. Um, you know, to, to do that process efficiently and to incorporate change throughout the process. Yeah, I think that um, on that on that point, you know, I think that that's having the phase gates where, you know, you close a phase, then you move on to the next one. That's still that very like waterfall thinking and, and methodology, which I have seen. Um, and, but now that, it, you know, a lot more companies, especially with software, are more into the agile methodology. And I've seen these companies, they completely just get rid of those 
the, the terminology of phase gates. And they go, you know, really at the end of the day with software, you, these, even though we can say we closed the phase and moved on to the next one, in reality, the phase is, it's still open, right? They're still going to have to come back, go back upstream and, and update things or make changes. So, you know, two of the companies I've been with have said, we're just going to get rid of that. That's what, that's waterfall. We want to be agile. And so we've, you know, really migrated over to the more agile methodology and terms. So there are activities that need to happen, but right. not necessarily, you know, with a formal phase methodology. Yeah. So, right. you know, as, as I've implemented before as a, as a checklist, right, story checklist for what you give the developer, uh, you know, has all of the prerequisite work been completed? Is it, is the story at a stage where it can be handed to a developer for execution? Uh, when this, the story has been developed by the developer and they're handing it through more checklists or check boxes to check uh, that subsequent uh, dependence or uh, prerequisites have been met for it to be released uh, to production, right? So, uh, to, you know, to me, the, uh, the issue with phase gates is the, is the notion that the gate is broad. It blocks everybody uh, and everybody has to arrive at the gate at the same time. Whereas what Agile is really encouraging you to do is run in parallel as has uh, as already been described here, uh, so that you're thinking about these gates on maybe a per task or a per feature basis, as opposed to comprehensive across the product. Right, that's again, the, the whole idea of don't be monolithic about this, that's, you know, that is, that does not work for, uh, uh, you're not getting any benefit out of Agile. Uh, it's sort of the, an, the, the, the anti-pattern to, uh, to Agile is, is, is everything is monolithic, including, you know, your, your, your design reviews, your input reviews, you know, your verification, it's all, it's all monolithic. You might as well stick with Waterfall in that case, right? So, a uh, couple interesting questions, a bit of pushback on, on the limits of some of what you guys are talking about. One, I do want to throw, Don, I see you're still on. You had two related questions you asked um, about documentation. First one was, I'd be concerned about a double book system. Doesn't that defeat the benefits of Agile? Would it be better to use the 62304 approach to classify your software components slash system for risk gauge, and then gauge the level of detail and documentation based on this? A single booking system and traceability could be most efficient. I I think that's true if you're doing the uh, um, if you're uh, ultimately anything that you're consuming, whether it's from the outside or inside, you want to have sort of basic level of documentation. You want to have basic understanding of what are the risks involved with it? How is it suitable for purpose and all of those things? So um, the question is, you know, uh, let's say for at what level of granularity do you do that? Let's say you are consuming outside services, you're consuming, uh, you know, Lambda functions or something like that, right? Um, is that the right, you know, you, you have to evaluate you know what are the risks that maybe go upstream from uh, from there, so that you might need to provide some level of documentation uh, for that. Uh, it's a question of sort of at you know how deep do you go, and that ultimately ends up being uh, a risk-based approach. So yes, I would agree with that. It depends on are are you a company like Google, for example, that has a little bit of medical device and a lot of other software, or are you a company that is a lot of medical device and a little bit of non-medical device software? If the answer is, you know, you're someone like Google, you apply the quality management system uh, to, to the medical device functionality and the layer below that at least, you know, uh, ask for a certain level of documentation uh, out of that, you know, in order to be able to consume those non-medical device services. If you're 90% medical device and 10% not, then yeah, just treat the other stuff, as, you know, as part of your quality management system. In general, you're doing the same stuff, right? You're, uh, if, if you're, you know, I mean, 
a little uh, uh, test driven development and behavior driven design goes a long way in general in software development and certainly helps dramatically in uh, in in medical device uh, software development too. Yeah, absolutely. And you know, when I talk about uh, maintaining two sets of books, you know, really what I'm what I mean by that is uh, there is a certain set of documentation that gets submitted to the regulator. Uh, and then there is another set of documentation that you're using internally to maintain your own quality for your own internal quality standards. So, uh, you know, my previous uh, life, uh, I was at a company where, uh, you know, we were, um, you know, we, we had the risk of a small software bug could potentially have cost us millions of dollars a day uh, with a particular system that we were working on. So we had to make damn well sure that that system was running reliably. Uh, and it wasn't, you know, a patient risk. It was our developer risk, right? You know, if we, uh, if we introduce one of these bugs and we're starting to cost uh, the company millions of dollars a day, well, you know, our necks are going to be on the line uh, or worse. And so, you know, you can think about this too, even within a medical device company, uh, let's say, um, you know, just as an example, uh, you know, Tandem uh, produces an insulin pump. That pump has uh, consumable supplies that need to be reordered periodically. That's a revenue stream, you know. What it and, and so we have software that will allow the user to place and manage their orders for supplies. Uh, what if that software has a bug, right? And it causes the, uh, uh, the the customers not to be charged the full amount for their supplies or their shipped extra supplies or, or whatever. It could cost the company a great deal of money. Um, you know, are you going to not follow the same uh, quality practices that your QMS dictates for your medical device? You probably want to, right? It's beneficial for your company to do that. Uh, does the FDA need to see all of your documentation around how you're doing supply ordering for your customers? Probably not. Probably don't want to know anything about it, right? Because it's not part of the, uh, the medical device. So when I say, uh, you know, double books, I'm really talking about you're doing all of the same things. Your developers are doing all of the same things. It's just that, and again, going back to the idea of documentation as code, when you generate your documentation from this code, uh, you're only generating for the regulator what the regulator needs to see uh, as part of that medical device filing. Um, one comment actually that Don adds here, I think that may help close this out. Current FDA regs for pre-market submissions require more documentation on interoperable systems, even those that are non-medical devices, when they interface with the medical device under submission. Yep, I think that's that's true. So yeah, though you know, it's not your need to apply design controls and risk management, understand you know the risks. Uh, don't stop purely at the edge of the medical device, right? So you you have to go. You have to go where the risk is, and obviously, in interoperable uh, medical devices, even if what you're interoperating with, or even if the data that you are potentially consuming doesn't come out of a medical device, doesn't mean you don't have to. You're responsible for managing the risk, even if it comes from somewhere else. So, yeah, I totally agree with that. Yeah, I would like to add uh, with respect to that. Um, you know, when you're making these uh, systems of systems or interoperable, or you're, you know interoperable with maybe non-med device systems uh, or external or whatever they are, you need to consistently ask yourself, what happens if this fails and how does it affect my device? And that, and then I've, I've kind of seen that if you continue to ask that, you start to flush out, um, uh, you know, you may, may introduce uh, new requirements or new risk mitigations. Um, whereas if you didn't ask those kinds of things and then it fails in which I, I have seen this happen in live, we have to go back and then we have to ask ourselves, why didn't we figure this out, right? No. What's interesting about some of these questions and responses is that one of the things that's changed in the last 10 years um, is who is a medical device maker? In the olden days, it was pretty clear, like you were in the FDA game, you did devices or you didn't. And there was sort of nothing in between. And if you built a device, it might be really sophisticated but it wasn't talking to a lot of other things other than maybe spitting out some summary reports. And in the last 10 years, we're seeing a lot more porous boundaries. You know, Google is a medical device company now. Apple's a medical device company now. Um, 
you know, I'm half expecting to see that McDonald's becomes a medical device company now, you know, or, you know, who, who knows who else, you know, the, the Pokemon has a medical device component. Um, and similarly, you know, the boundaries of medical devices are getting blurry as medical devices start to support and rely more and more on non-device things. You have medical devices calling weather.com to look at pollution data to help, you know, give recommendations based for your, you know, your respiratory function or your, you know, your dry eye based on that. So it's, it's, it's a blurrier line. And so now some of the things we're describing simply, I don't think were issues 10 years ago. Did you have companies 10 years ago that had millions of lines of code base that work device and then a couple thousand that were work? I think that's also, yeah, interoperability in a, in a world where everything is connected and potentially interoperable becomes much more complex, right? If you have, let's say, uh, you know, a digital diagnostic that uses smartphone sensors, feeds it into an, uh, an AI algorithm, and maybe the AI algorithm is actually up in the cloud rather than, than on the smartphone, one of your distribution mechanism means for this might be, hey, let's go through telemedicine or hospital at home uh, providers who have their own applications, right? So then what your, what your medical device becomes a reference application, an SDK, you know, that can get integrated into that telemedicine application and your AI algorithm in the cloud. Right. So that's a really different kind of interoperability than maybe was was foreseen uh, in the past. And I think we're we're still, I think, you know, uh, going to be dealing with those use cases in a way that right now the guidance uh, around interoperability or even, you know, standards like the UL standard are haven't really envisioned. So we're going to have to we're going to have to update those and figure out ways of managing risk uh, in, you know, in those circumstances where not everything is in your control and, 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 uh, and the overall system complexity becomes much greater. So. A couple of other questions that I think are probably sort of standalone questions, although they, everything relates to everything in this conversation. Uh, PJ is asking, what are your thoughts about the FDA's computer software assurance uh, initiative and how to assess risk? And maybe whoever answers, if you could discuss a little bit of what that computer software assurance is first, for those who don't know. Well, Randy, since you're the co-chair of the, the Amy Cloud Committee, you might be the right one to, to, to tackle that one first, unless you, you know, if, unless you don't want to. I'm not a doctor. I just play one on TV. <laughs> no. Actually, Michael, are you comfortable taking a first pass of that one? And I'll, I'll yeah, add I it. yeah. So I haven't seen this the new uh, CSA uh, framework actually being used yet, and I don't think that they've had the final guidance. Um, although I could be wrong. Um, but what I understand it as, um, you know, the FDA went uh, they went out and said uh, they benchmarked these companies and they said, hey, uh, what they found out was the companies were spending eighty like eighty percent of their time documenting uh, what the system is and what it does, uh, requirements and all that kind of stuff. And they were spending the other 20% of the time actually testing it and ensuring that it works. And they basically turned around and said, well, let's flip that around and basically say 80% of your time should be spent making sure the system works as intended. And the other 20% uh, should be spent on the documentation. However, that's not to say you're doing less documentation. They just want you to spend more time making sure your system works as, as it should. That's how I, I understood it. Yeah, and, and so I think one of the things that is, is going to be, uh, that we're wrestling with in other uh, areas, right, is, you know, the concept here that, uh, as, as uh, Randy and Pat have coined it, uh, tiny gives, this is not your grandmother's validated state, right? You're, you're dealing with systems where not everything is in your control, right? The cloud, uh, um, BYOD mobile apps, interoperable systems with, uh, uh, with, with many other uh, um, uh, integrations, uh, et cetera. So, you know, I think we're still working through some of that um, 
uh, in particular with how software assurance is uh, is being defined, but I think it's moving from the, you know, locked validated state where we were before to taking more of a risk-based uh, approach to when and what are you emphasizing to try to make sure, you know, during both during the design and development process, but also when you're out in market uh, to uh, to reducing the risk um, uh, of failures uh, 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 from software, right? It's funny that I would throw back to, there's a classic Doonesbury comic from 1990 during the first Gulf War where these two American soldiers are in a foxhole and the commander comes up to them with a pallet of water bottles and basically says, this is your ration for today and out breaks it down of how much water they have to stay just to stay hydrated for the day. And it comes down to you know, one glass every 10 minutes. And he goes, good luck, man. And he walks away. And one guy looks at the other one and goes, well, what happens if we come under fire? And he goes, don't worry, I'll cover you while you drink. <laughs> at what point does the documentation, the process exceed what the, what you're actually supposed to be doing in the process? Um well, that's where that's where again, you know, if you are leveraging tools to automate uh, 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 a lot of this documentation using you know machine readable slash human readable uh, things as part of that, so the documentation is sort of is automatically generated out of your processes, you can save, you can get the documentation you need and save, you know, a, a, a lot of time uh, and effort on that and use that for better risk management and things like that. Use that to not just do pre-market risk management, but actually get the signals out there in the market uh, from your ac actual use of your product were you right in your risk management? Are there new risks you need to uh, deal with and actually incorporate that back in? You you can use that savings for for that type of stuff uh, that actually will make a difference in in terms of patient safety and uh, and improving uh, real world outcomes. Uh, a question from the engineering crowd, Milos. Does the FDA welcome behavior-driven development? So if somebody could first maybe give a little explanation of what is behavior-driven development and answer the question, that'd be great. Larkin, do you wanna? Well, I don't, I don't know the do textbook that. definition, but I'll tell you how I understand it, right? I, I look at it as uh, documenting user behaviors uh, in, the, you know, in the form very similar to how you would define re user requirements. Uh, and you build your uh, software and your, especially your test automation around those defined behaviors, um, as opposed to, uh, you know, designing purely a software function, you know, this function shall take these inputs and produce these outputs. You're defining uh, users. And there was a question in the, in the Q and A about uh, personas, you know, you take your persona, uh, you know, I am a, uh, a physician logging into the system and I want to see a particular report, right? You are defining this user behavior uh, to define what the software should do and what the acceptance criteria is for that uh, behavior, how the system should respond to that behavior. So um, I can't, you know, Bernhard or, or Michael can speak more about the uh, FDA's acceptance of it, but um, what the heck else would you do? <laughs> right. <laughs> I would say, you know, the FDA in general is agnostic, right? They're not saying you have to do this or you can't do this, et cetera. Um, they, uh, uh, but in general, you know, this is, uh, this is how, uh, this is how you construct ultimately verification protocols, right? Those are, if I, I, I wouldn't know how to do agile and uh, and generate verification protocols out of that uh, without doing behavior driven design right I think it's a it's it makes that part generating and running verification protocols much much easier and that's how we've done it and how most people uh, that are really following agile development in the medical device space do it and I've not seen certainly not in the last seven, eight years, anyone at the FDA saying, what is this, <laughs> right? The documentation they get out of it 
um, they want you to do more testing, right? Uh, where I've had, I have seen, you know, re remediation efforts where we've done where the FDA has said, yeah, when you guys did this initially, we weren't asking for unit tests. We weren't asking for all of these types of things. Things have changed. This is now part of what we have to have and what what we need. So I think they've gotten more sophisticated on software and good software practices. So, you know, if you do that, you're on the right track. It's not all you need to do, but are, those are inputs into your verification protocols that make life so much easier. Yeah, I kind of I kind of think about behavior driven development as something that is essentially that iteration zero or that bridge to development part of your design inputs, right? You know, you get your um, your testers in, you get your, and your testers are probably going to sit there with the, while you're making requirements and start doing their own test driven development and getting tests in early. Um, and then the developers you want to have in as well, because if you're developing uh, any kind of system requirements or software requirements, if there's a technical constraint, you want to know that upfront so that you can make adjustments rather than downstream uh, in the development phase. Okay. So if, because we've already been at it for an hour and 15 minutes and I don't want to, 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 to overstay our welcome, why don't we do a set of wrap down questions, wrap up questions here. Um, and we had a couple of, it's funny, the question, the last question I wanted to cover uh, ties in very well. So let me preface this that, you know, Larkin, Michael, Bernhard, you're each going to be asked to answer the question. We've talked a lot about best practices. Let's talk for a minute about worst practices. No matter what, if you take nothing else away from this, when you're using with agile medical devices for the love of everything good, please never do dot, dot, dot. And Larkin, I'm going to tee that up uh, with a question. This may be a little unfair, but my question is, what do you think about hybrid development, agile and waterfall? Um, uh, let's see. Oil and water is maybe not right. It's more like, uh, uh, I don't know. Uh, Gasoline and matches, maybe. Vinegar uh, and bleach. Yeah, so they're, and bleach. they're they're fundamentally incompatible in, in terms of philosophy, right? Uh, waterfall is making the assumption that you can understand the problem and the solution at the same time, holistically, right? As a as a totality, uh, agile makes the assumption that you can't. And therefore, you need to break down the problem and you need to reduce it down to small bite-sized uh, chunks and learn what you don't know through a process of iteration, right? So fundamentally, these two concepts are at odds where, where uh, Waterfall is attempting to uh, get everybody into a room, you know, lock, everybody gets locked into a room and, you know, we're tying our, our arms together and we're not, nobody's going to get, you know, let out of the room until we've figured out the entire problem. And, uh, you know, when you have agile people mix into that, uh, you know, they're just, they're just not going to be compatible. Yeah. I, I mean, honestly, right, when it, it, the, the, the big question to ask is, do you know everything? And are you going to know everything before you start development, right? And you know, most of the time we're building a new product. We are not, you know, uh, we're, we're not do or, or updating and improving a product, right? Uh, very rarely are we doing something where we have perfect knowledge uh, ahead of time. Uh, and the way to get that perfect knowledge is not analysis paralysis. It's small, you know, fast feedback loops and making adjustments. That way you don't make big mistakes that are costly and have to go back and 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 not handle change in new knowledge. Um, I have a, a, a number of things that are sort of like worst practices. I think, you know, I, I, I think hybrid is difficult. Um, I, I do think making sure that your quality management system is agile compatible or is compatible with sort of the ability to to change and adjust along the way. So I've seen this before where you have the development methodology baked into the quality management system uh, so that you you can't really do agile. Well, if that's what your quality management, how your quality management system is organized, 
you know, fix that first before you try to do agile development within that. You know, you want to loosely couple your development methodology with your with your quality management system as opposed to tightly coupling it. Um, in general, if you're doing agile, uh, automate as much as you can <laughs> in the process. Uh, cause if you don't automate, then you're going to slow down. And so that extends to documentation and to design controls, not just purely, uh, uh the development and the testing, uh, uh, of that. Um, and then, you know, there's people that come at it from a agile just means don't bother me. I'm going to do whatever, however I want to do that. Right. That's not what, that's not real agile development. That's called cowboy coding. And uh, there are people that think of agile that way from the outside, but there are also developers that maybe haven't gone through real, you know, uh, agile processes that do that. And then you wonder, it's like, what? <laughs> that's not usable within, you know, not just a, um, you know, a, a regulated uh, system, but any kind of, you know, large thing that needs to be reliable uh, and needs to work, right? So Michael, will you, uh, will you bring it home here? <laughs> For the love of everything. Good. Yeah, yeah. Uh, or as one of my middle schoolers, when they were in middle school would have said, what's grosser than gross? <laughs> Uh, yeah, so some of the don'ts, you know, I, there's quite a few that I can think of off the top of my head, but if, if I really had to, if I really had to hit the nail on the head with one of them, I would say, um, you know, don't forget about risk management. You know, once we put, you know, a lot of teams will think about, okay, we only do risk management for the first release of the product and we put that on the market. And if we make design changes or hot fixes or anything like that, uh, and you go through your, you know, your design change process. I've seen a lot of team members go through that uh, change request and for the risk management portion, they check there's no risk associated with this and they push it through. And then uh, me as quality assurance, I always ch will challenge them on that if it says there's no risk associated with this because I'm like, there, at some level, there's always risk associated with the change that we're making. Um, so I see, that quite, I see that happen quite a bit. I think a lot of the engineers are under pressure with timelines, uh, times to get fixes out the door. And so they kind of just go into, uh, you know, autopilot mode and they start just checking no impact, no impact, no impact. And so really that for me, that that's not the, the right answer. So I would really say as you're, you know, once you put a product on the market, if you're making changes, even if it's just a simple hot fix updates, really, really consider and think about risk management. No, that's, that's a good one. And, you know, maybe I, the way that I might think about this is that for any particular change, you need to document what the impact is right? And whatever that impact is, you can assess what, you know, what the risk level is. Is it a zero? Is it a 10? Um, but if you just simply say, you know, like Michael saying, oh, there's no impact, uh, you haven't actually thought about whether there is or it isn't, right? If you can't enumerate what the impacts are, clearly you haven't thought about the problem. Right. And I say like on top of that, whenever I, you know, if when I've met with the teams and I've challenged them on this and they say, no, there really is no impact to risk or safety or security or privacy, then I say, okay, then then put that in this change request. Tell me why there's no risk, right? Don't just say NA or there's no risk or no impact. Okay. Well, thank you to all of you, our panelists. Thank you for our audience, including a Pretty sizable number of people have hung in with us here for almost an hour and a half. We will be doing more of these, so send us your questions. We want to know what topics you're interested in. We want to know what questions you're interested in. We could do more webinars. Frankly, we can do smaller roundtable discussions if there's interest about going deeper in a real interactive conversation with a group of people. Let us know. We really want to make this a value for everybody uh, as, we, as we continue this over the second half of the year. Thank you very much. Thanks, Great, everyone. Thank you. All right, thank you. Yeah. All right. Bye. Bye-bye.